Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When the Bible speaks of the Son as in the Son of God, we need to realize that it's speaking in a very powerful way because the term Son is related to submissiveness. When the Bible speaks of Yeshua as the Son of God, it's not lessening Him. It's not saying that He's less than God. For we know that the Scripture says that God sent His only begotten Son into this world, and Yeshua did not think of Himself less than God. For example, in the book of Ephesians, He says that He did not think of equality with God was something to, to be grasped, meaning He didn't need to do anything to reach that status. Yeshua is the Son of God. He is fully God. He is divine. But when the Bible speaks of sonship, it's speaking about Yeshua's total commitment to His Father's purposes and plans. And that's why in this book of John, Messiah speaks of Himself in two ways, as the Son, but also as the one who the Father sent into this world. And these two concepts, sonship, and being sent simply speaks about Him doing everything according to His Heavenly Father's will. Well, we are in the midst of our study of the book of John. We are in the middle of John chapter 5, and there Messiah had just spoken to the leaders about Him being the Son of God, speaking about His Father. And immediately those who were in leadership understood that he had made himself equal to God, and they were very upset with this. One of the truths that you and I need to realize is this, that our Savior is God. That is to say this, that God sent his Son into this world in order that God would be our Savior. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of John, chapter 5, and now we're ready for verse 19. John chapter 5 and verse 19, we read how Messiah responds to those leaders. Yeshua answered therefore and he said to them, now your Bible probably says truly, truly, which is fine, but it's the word amen and it's repeated twice because there's a connection between that word amen, which is derived, it's actually, although it's Greek here, it's actually a Hebrew word. And it means believe, or it's related to truth. Those two things, so simply believe the truth. And that's why so often in English we find the phrase, truly, truly. So he says, look again at verse 19. Amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you that the Son, and pay attention to that. Notice how he's speaking about the Son, the one who was sent, he reads, the Son is able to do nothing of Himself. Now, it's simply pointing out how Messiah did not come to do His will. He did not do anything that was of His own personal motivation. Why? As a, an example to us. That we are not supposed to do things simply because it motivates us. We want those things. Rather, we are always called to show our allegiance to our Savior by doing His will. And that's why we find in this passage, Messiah is speaking and He says, the Son is able to do nothing of His own self, but rather what He sees the Father does, for this one also does. So once again, we're seeing how Yeshua speaks about Himself, paying attention, watching His Father, and doing the same thing. That is to show us a commitment to obedience. 
And it's only when we are willing to obey God, to submit to His plans and His purposes, then and only then are we going to be faithful servants. And that's what this passage of Scripture is trying to teach us. We are supposed to look at Messiah Yeshua, showing how He perfectly followed, how He submitted and obeyed, and we're supposed to do that same very thing. So we read here, but what he sees the father doing for this one also does. Now, notice what else we see in this passage. Drop down to verse 20. Not only does it say that likewise he does, but in verse 20 he says, for the father loves the son. And what's important here is this. This is not the normal word we find, especially in the book of John, for love. For example, we studied a few weeks ago, John chapter 3 and verse 16, that very famous passage where it says, In this God so loved the world that He gave. And we spoke about how this word, agape, in the Greek language, speaks about a giving, a sacrificial love. But in this portion of Scripture, it's not the word agape, it's a word phileo. What's the difference? Well, this means to be pleased and like. Let me give an example of what I'm speaking about. Now, as, as people from a family, we love our relatives. We love our spouse and we love our children. And it doesn't matter what they do or what, our love continues on. But this is a word more related to likes. Sometimes, for example, my wife will get angry with me and I'll ask her, do you still love me? And she'll say, well, I love you, but at this moment, I don't like you very much. But in this passage, it's speaking about love in the sense of liking, that when the son submits to the father, he is well pleased. And that's what it's saying. So look again at verse 20. For the father loves the son, and when we act in a way that is pleasing to the Father, when we act in obedience, what can we expect? Well, the answer is we can expect revelation. When we act in obedience, God will begin to reveal to us greater things. And one of the things that He reveals is His personal plan and purpose for our life. You see, we know from the Word of God, and we've studied this before, we know from the Word of God what God has called His people in a general sense to do. But it's only when we begin to act out of obedience, act in faithfulness, act applying the truth to our life, then God is going to begin to direct our ways, to order our steps where He wants us as individuals to be and what He wants us to do in those situations. So He says in verse 20, for the Father loves the Son, and all things, and I love that, all things without limitation, all things He will show to Him to, to what He should do, and greater things than these, and the word here is not things, but literally it's the word works. So greater works than these will He show Him in order that we might marvel. Now, what's He speaking about in this passage? Well, we know in John chapter 5 that Messiah did a great miracle. He took one who was lame and he healed him. And we talked about last week how that miracle has great significance because a person who is lame being healed and walking, well, that is a messianic symbol. And this uh, causing someone to rise up physically, one who is paralyzed, well, that is reminiscent to a, a typology, a typology of what? Resurrection. So when the rabbis, when they speak about those who are lame walking, it, it foreshadows the kingdom. But Messiah is here not just to teach us something about the kingdom, but he came to reveal kingdom truth. And one of the things that we're going to see throughout this fifth chapter of the book of John is that there's going to begin an emphasis upon the kingdom reality, that he came to reveal kingdom truth to us. So he says, greater works than these, these healings I'm going to do, that you might marvel. Look now to verse 21. 
In verse 21, we read, For as the Father raises the dead and makes life. So now we have a clear reference. Earlier on in John chapter 5, this, this causing the lame person to stand up personifies, it foreshadows what he's talking about right now when he speaks about the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. And once again, whenever we speak about the resurrection, there is something that should come into our mind. And what is that? It is the kingdom of God. Over and over, we're going to see that the emphasis of everything that Messiah is speaking about in this chapter and the next chapter is the kingdom of God. That we're supposed to be people who understand the kingdom, its truth, and exemplify that kingdom truth in our lives that manifests the glory and the power of God to others that will cause those to be brought as well into that same truth, into that same realization. So we speak in verse 21, this verse it says, For just as the Father raises the dead and makes alive, thus also the Son whom He wills. So now we're going to be seeing a transition from that which is normally thought of as God's work, meaning God the Father. We're going to see that that is going to be extended to and being given to the Messiah that He carries it out. And basically what we're speaking about is a rabbinical concept that is based in the book of Daniel and chapter 7. In that chapter, we see that Messiah presents himself to the Heavenly Father and he inherits. And likewise, in that passage of Scripture, we see that Messiah, the term that is being used there is Son. Why is that important? Well, the Son not only submits, but because he pleases the Father, we're going to find that the term heir as one who inherits also adaptly describes this concept of son. So Messiah is going to inherit the role of his heavenly father and he actually is the one that is going to carry them out in the kingdom. And what do I mean carry them out? What I'm speaking about is carrying out the purposes of the kingdom which can be summarized with two words. The word promise and the word blessing. Messiah, he's the key for us inheriting the promises of God, the blessings of God. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, we read here and we find just as the Father, He has power to make a life, so too does the Son. And He raises up what the Scripture says is that He also will rise, cause to rise the dead, those who want, those whom He wills. Now, what is it trying to share with us now? Well, if you're wise, what you're going to ask yourself is this. How can I behave? What is it that is incumbent upon me to do that the Father, the Son, might desire to see me in that kingdom? What is my response? What should it be for the Son to want will that He rises or makes me to rise on that day? That's what we should be asking ourselves. Well, move on to verse 22. It says, not only does the Son make alive whom He wills, but notice something else in verse 22. It says, for the Father judges no one. Now, usually you think of God the Father as the judge, but once again, what we're seeing is this transfer. That which commonly, what we thought belonged to the Father, all of that is being transferred to the Son. So we read in verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but all judgment has been given to the Son, in order that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now, this is also very important because it picks up on the latter half of that section that we talked about in Daniel chapter 7 that speaks of a very important revelation, and that is this. In the book of Daniel chapter 7, the Ancient of Days, and that is a term, an Old Testament term for God, 
the Ancient of Days displays upon His Son that all people, all languages, all tribes, all nationalities should worship the Son. And that's exactly what John is picking upon in this passage. He's picking up on the fact that this transfer has occurred back in Daniel chapter 7 when God the Son approached God his Heavenly Father and this was all given to him. And now this one is standing before humanity. So we read in this passage of Scripture, For the Father judges no one, He has given all judgment to the Son, and what's the implication? That all people should honor the Son just like they do the Father. And then we find something very, very important. We read in verse 24, For truly, truly, I say to you, that the word that my, the word, my word, that that you are hearing, and you should believe in who? The one that He has sent, in order that you have eternal life. Now, there's a very important point that we see here. We're talking now once again about eternal life. And this eternal life is, well, it should be, and we've spoken of this, it should be understood as the kingdom life. There in the kingdom, we find those two things, the promises of God being realized and the blessings of God. And these things are foundational for what we would call just a natural outcome. And what is that? Worship. See, many people say, well, when I'm in the kingdom of heaven and, and, and I'm supposed to worship God, you know, will that just come about? It will. Because it is the natural outcome of being in God's presence. It is the natural outcome of being recipients of the prom- promises and the blessings of God. Now, there's something else that I want to touch on. Many of you know that I consider myself to be a Messianic Jew. And there's something that's called Messianic Judaism. And it's very, very similar to Christianity theologically, but sometimes Messianic Judaism expresses itself in worship a little bit different than what you would find in a common church. And Messianic Judaism sometimes has different theology, and that can be very problematic. Why do I say that? Well, there is a leader. I know him personally. He's a very nice gentleman. He is very intelligent. He is a man that loves God, but simply loving God doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to understand the truth. And sometimes I think his love is is more rooted in a love for his fellow Jews than a commitment to submit to the truths of God. Why do I say that? Well, this is his theology. He says, you know, that term, Jesus, is very hard for the Jewish community, and that's true, because many ungodly, anti-Semitic things have been done in the name of Jesus Christ. So there is a problem with Jewish people just hearing that name, and that's why oftentimes I prefer the term Yeshua. Now, when you worship, when you speak, it doesn't matter if you use the term Yeshua, or Jesus, I have many friends that speak Spanish, or Jesus, when you're referring to God's only begotten Son. Whatever language you speak, speak to Him and call Him by that name. But but here's the problem. This one teaches that, that one doesn't really have to acknowledge that name Yeshua, or Jesus, or Jesus, as long as someone believes two things, and that's this. If they believe that that God of Israel is a one true God and there is a Messiah. See, that's not what the scripture says. Yes, we need to acknowledge the God of Israel. Yes, we need to believe that there's a Messiah. But those who are saved, those who have experienced true redemption, they're the ones who have done so by name. Why do I say that? Well, for example, in the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there's a very important verse of Scripture. And that verse says this, that there's no other name given to man by which one is saved rather than the name Yeshua or Jesus. So if you don't know that name, if you have not invited Yeshua personally into your life, if you just simply believe there is a Messiah, but you don't know the name of Messiah, you are not saved. 
You do not have that covenantal relationship that will lead a great change and transformation of your life. So it's very important. Why do I say that? Well, let's go back to a per portion of scripture that we've already studied. Go back, if you would, to verse 23. We read here, in order that all would honor the Son just as he honors the Father. For the one who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, why is that so important? Because of this. My friend, he teaches, see, he believes that only Yeshua is the Savior. And he believes in the Trinity, that there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, but one God. Now, that's fine. So what he says is this. He says, if someone, literally, if a Jewish person is worshiping God, well, by default, he's also, whether he realizes it or not, he's worshiping the Son. But that's not what the Scripture says. When we look at the Scripture, it says, it is not enough simply to honor God the Father. In fact, the order is very different. God says in this passage, that is, it, it is incumbent upon someone to honor the Son. And in honoring the Son, you honor the Father. It's not the other way around. You can't say, why well, honor God the Father? And by default, I don't even know who the Son is. I'm not even sure there is a Son. But I believe in God the Father. That is not sufficient. That is not a, a true uh, statement of, of salvation. So we find that John is very, very clear. If you're going to honor the Father first, there's an order, you have to honor the Son who sent Him. Now look again at verse 24. We find here that the one who is hearing my word and believing in the one that sent me, this one has eternal life and he will not come into judgment. So it's only when we follow the order when we believe in the one that God the Father has sent. When we do what? When we hear, and that word, and we'll see this in a few minutes, that word here has to do with obedience. Now, we're not saved by obedience, but here it's talking about a response. We need to respond to the truth of God. So the one who, it says, believes, what happens to him? Look at the end of verse 24, it says, this one, should not uh, suffer judgment. What's going to happen? We read here that this one is going to pass from death into life. Verse 25. For truly, truly, I say to you that the hour is, is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, here's what's important. It's not the voice of God the Father. It's the voice of the Son of God. And biblically, what we need to understand is that it's only those who have an expectation of, of Messiah that believe in Him as the one that God the Father who sent into the world. And it's the Son. Remember how an earlier, this last study that we did previous to this one, spoke about how Messiah spoke of Himself as the Son of God and the rabbis understood that this made Him equal to God, that he is divine. So we read, and the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and the ones hearing shall live, because the Father has life in himself, and thus he has given it to the Son life. For he has life in himself, and verse 27, and he has authority to give it to him and to judge. So what God the Father has done is that He has given Yeshua all authority for what? Well, we've already talked about that, for judgment. He's the one who is going to determine who's in the kingdom of God and who's not. All judgment has been given, all authority has been given to who? Well, it says to Yeshua because of what? Because He is the Son of Man. Now, there's a very important transition here. We've been talking about him being the Son of God, which it is. But now it's talking about the Son of Man. And why is that so important? Well, we have learned that that term, Son of Man, is, is spoken of 
in the prophecy of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, more than any other prophet, he defines, he describes the kingdom of God. This term, son of man, speaks about servant. That Yeshua was sent into this world to serve his heavenly father and do the work of redemption. And therefore, it's only those who have received the work of the Son, the Son of Man, who lay down His life that we might have life. It's only those who are going to be raised up on those last days. Verse 28, he says, Do not marvel at this, that the hour has come in which all those in the tombs, they will hear His voice, and what will they do? And they will come out. Those who have done good, they for resurrection of life. And those who have practiced evil, and this word practice, it has to do with an overwhelming characteristic. That when you look at their life, it is evil. What does that mean? It means outside or contrary to the will and the purposes of God. For those who have practiced evil unto a resurrection of judgment. Now, these two concepts, a resurrection of life and a resurrection of judgment, where do we find that? Well, once again, so much of what John is sharing in this passage of Scripture has to do with revelation, prophetic revelation, from the book of Daniel. And if you look sometime at the book of Daniel chapter 12, you will see that Daniel speaks of two resurrections, a resurrection of the righteous, and a resurrection of condemnation or judgment. So once again, what we're finding is that John is basing his revelation, his truth, he's basing all of that on the Old Testament. So if you want to understand New Testament truth, you have to understand the Old Testament backgrounds for that truth. But look again what he says. Those that are in the tomb, they will hear his voice there's an expectation. They expect that because they have believed in the Son of Man, this Redeemer. And they will come out, those who have done good, that is, those who responded to God and according to His will. Now, we're not saved by our response, but that's got to be the objective of our salvation experience. We want to be saved so that we can be people who walk in the will of God. So let me leave you with that question. Are you someone who desires God's will in their life? Do you want to be participants in the will of God? If you do, then you are a candidate for salvation. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>